Hello and welcome back to Bogart on Movies. My friends, as we all know, there are good movies and bad ones, winners and losers. But this week, I've got another look at six, count them six, great ones. We're preparing for a new season which starts next week, and we appreciate your being with us and supporting us. So by the way of saying thanks, we're bringing back our take on some of the best the movies have had to offer, classics and more. And we'll answer your email, have one of Carla's campy picks, busy, busy, busy. So let's get going. This week's look at a classic film begins with an observation. There are a few actors and performers who are so iconic, so long lasting, that many years after they've gone, you hear their name and your mind instantly flashes to a particular person, Elvis, Bogey, Marilyn, and Frank. If we only had a lousy little friend, we could be a millionaire. If the size of your bundle you want to increase, I'll arrange that you go broken, quiet, and peace. In a hideout provided by Nathan, where there are no neighbors to squawk. It's the oldest established permanent voting Frank in New York. Frank. The movie, of course, is Guys and Dolls, my favorite movie musical. Now I know that some critics said that Sinatra was too slick for the role, how can that be? That Marlon Brando, who played Sky Masterson, couldn't sing the part. Give me a break. This is entertainment, the way a movie should be. The music by Frank Lesser is as good as it gets. The supporting cast, Gene Simmons as Sister Sarah Brown, Broadway great Stubby Kay as Nicely Nicely, and Vivian Blaine reprising her role in Adelaide. Perfection. A few years ago, I spoke to my friends Nancy and Tina Sinatra, who were almost my stepsisters, but that's another story, about the criticism of their father and the movie. They said the proof is in the performance. Judge for yourself. When you see a guy reach for stars in the sky, you can bet that he's doing it for some doll. When you spot a John waiting out in the rain, Chances are he's insane, as only a John can be for a Jane. When you meet a gent, paying all kinds of rent, for a flat that could flatten the Taj Mahal. Call it sad, call it funny, but it's better than even money, that the guy's only doing it for some dog. When you see a Joe saving half of his dough, you can bet there'll be mink in it for some doll. When a bum buys wine like a bum can't afford, it's a cinch that the bum is under the thumb of some little broad. When you meet a mug lately out of the jug, and he's still lifting platinum for the roll. Call it hell, call it heaven, it's a probable 12 to 7 that the guy's only doing it for some time. You see a sport and his cash has run short you can bet he's been blowing it on some doll when a guy wears tails with the front gleaming white who the heck do you think he's tickling pink on saturday night when some lazy slob gets a good steady job and he smells from vitalis and barbasol Call it dumb, call it clever, ah, but you can give odds forever that the guy's only doing it for some doll, some doll, some doll. The guy's only doing it for some doll. As an aside, there are a number of family connections here. The film's director was Joseph L. Mankiewicz, who also wrote and directed The Barefoot Contessa, starring my father. 
and the book was written by Joe Swirling and Abe Burroughs, who also wrote the book for 1965's Cactus Flower, starring my mother in her second Broadway appearance. My advice, forget the critics and enjoy this wonderful movie. Tonight in our classic movie segment, we're going to have fun with film noir, 1944's Double Indemnity. You handle just automobile insurance or all kinds? All kinds. Fire, earthquake, theft, public liability, group insurance, industrial stuff, and so on right down the line. Accident insurance? Accident insurance? Sure, Mr. Dietrichson. Wish you tell me what's engraved on that anklet. Just my name. As for instance? Phyllis. Phyllis, huh? I think I like that. But you're not sure. Well, I'd have to drive it around the block a couple of times. Mr. Neff, why don't you drop by tomorrow evening around 8.30? He'll be in then. Who? My husband. You were anxious to talk to him, weren't you? Yeah, I was, but uh, I'm sort of getting over the idea, if you know what I mean. There's a speed limit in this state, Mr. Neff. 45 miles an hour. How fast was I going, officer? I'd say around 90. Suppose you get down off your motorcycle and give me a ticket. Suppose I let you off with a warning this time. Suppose it doesn't take. Suppose I have to whack you over the knuckles. Suppose I bust out crying and put my head in your shoulder. Suppose you try putting it on my husband's shoulder. The crackling screenplay was co-written by the legendary writer-director Billy Wilder, certainly one of the most respected and the best directors and writers Hollywood has ever seen. Wilder also directed the movie, and novelist Raymond Chandler who also created Detective Philip Marlowe, played, by the way, by my father in The Big Sleep. Uh, it stars Fred McMurray. You'll see him in a totally different light from the Stephen Douglas we know from TV's My Three Sons, the vastly underrated and wonderful Barbara Stanwyck, and Edward G. Robinson, who really makes the movie come to life. Check out this scene for vintage Edward G. Hello, Keys. What's on your mind? That broken leg. The guy had a broken leg. What are you talking about? I'm talking about Dietrichson. He had accident insurance, didn't he? Yeah. And then he broke his leg, didn't he? So what? And he didn't put in a claim. Why didn't he put in a claim? Why? What are you driving at? Walter, I had dinner two hours ago. And it's stuck halfway. Little man of yours is acting up again, huh? There's something wrong with the Dietrichson case. Why, oh, because he didn't file a claim? Maybe he just didn't have time. Maybe he just didn't know that he was insured. No, no, that couldn't be it. Uh, you delivered the policy to him personally, didn't you? Yeah. You got his check. Sure I did. Got any bicarbonate of soda? The movies about McMurray is the dark and kind of psycho insurance agent, Robinson as his boss, and Stanwyck, I always love Barbara Stanwyck, at her best as the housewife, who we find out wants her husband dead. So she buys an insurance policy on his life with double indemnity. It's me I'm talking about. I don't want to be left out of it. Stop saying that. It's just that it hasn't worked out as we wanted. We can't go through with it, that's we all. We have gone through with it, Walter. The tough part is all behind us. We just have to hold on now and not go soft inside. Stick close together the way we started out. Watch it. I wasn't going to do anything about it, not until I met you. You planned the whole thing. I only wanted him dead. And I'm the one that fixed it so he was dead. Is that what you're telling me? And nobody's pulling out. We went into this together and we're coming out at the end together. It's straight down the line for both of us. Remember? That's great film noir music. This is film noir at its best, directed by a real legend. Hope you enjoy it. This week, our look at a classic film begins with a quiz. Here we go. What movie starred Henry Fonda, Jimmy Stewart, Gregory Peck, 
are the Duke John Wayne, Robert Preston, the brilliant musical actor, the music man, the underrated Richard Widmark, and was narrated by Spencer Tracy. I'll give you all a minute to put those answers together, but here are some more clues if you haven't gotten it yet. Among its three directors was four-time Academy Award winner John Ford. Its musical score, written by Alfred Newman, no, not the Mad Magazine guy, obviously, who incidentally did How to Marry a Millionaire, starring my mom, Lauren Bacall, Marilyn Monroe, and Betty Grable, was voted number 25 of all time by the American Film Institute. Listen. <laughs> If you don't have it by now, it's a true epic, made in 1962, How the West Was Won. It begins in about 1840 and depicts four generations of one family and their move west, from the Erie Canal to the Pacific Ocean, and has chapters on the Civil War and outlaws. Now, do you have to take a bit of dramatic license with history in this movie? Absolutely. This movie is not history. Life then was a lot harder than depicted in the movie, but this is a slice of what life was like for a lot of people back then, all rolled into the Prescott family. Is the laddie's health the reason you're heading west? Partly. Only partly. Mostly our trouble east was rocks. I had me a farm where some years I'd raise a hundred bushels of rocks to the acre. Now, Zebulon, you hadn't ought to lie to the man like that. Wife, I'm a God-fearing soul, and I tell the truth as I see it. Now, I never used a plow. I'd blast out the furrows with gunpowder. And then one morning, I hauled the bucket up from out of the well, and so help me, the bucket was full of rocks. Rocks! I just stood there right still, trying not to blaspheme. And I said to myself, you've got a son that's ailing, you've got a 20-year-old daughter what won't take to herself a husband. There she sits over there, mooning as usual. Aww. And you've got another daughter who just don't seem quite right in the head. Lilith! Now, I remind you, sir, I'm still standing there holding a bucket full of rocks and staring into a bleak old age. So I made me a vow right then and there. I said, if I can find a man with $500 who likes rocks, then there's going to be another fool owning this farm. Well, sir, the Lord provided such a man, and here I am. Uh, that was Carl Malden. An excitement? This film has it in spades. This movie has got real star power, superstar power. Here are a couple of scenes with John Wayne and with Henry Fonda. A month ago, they were saying I was crazy, insane. Now they're calling me a hero. But hero or crazy, I'm the same man. Doesn't matter what the people think. It's what you think, Grant. You mean that's Grant? I reckon. General Grant. You know this war is going to be won in the West. You know how to win it. 
Everything you've done proves it. And I say that a man has the right to resign only if he's wrong, <clears throat> not if he's right. Your name Jethro Stewart? All right, get at it! Well, Mr. Did... Jethro Stewart, you're hired to hunt buffalo to feed these men, not to stop their work. Why'd you bring these bodies here? The railroaders. I thought somebody in the railroad might be interested. I'm the railroad, and I'm not interested. You should have buried them where you found them, then tracked down the Indians who did it. Well, Mr. King, like you said, I was hired to hunt, not to dig graves or fight engines. Those fellas are mostly old soldiers. You wouldn't think double dead men bother them much? Look, I don't want anything in their thick skulls but their work, you understand? Now get rid of those bodies. Start tracking those Indians. You keep forgetting, Mr. King. My job's Buffalo. It was Buffalo. Go to the paymaster and draw your time. Well, now, that foreman fella, you didn't fire him. You just took him down the peg because you needed him. Who's going to shoot Buffalo, you? And see how many other names and faces you can recognize in the movie. It's exciting, it's interesting, it's fun, and it's definitely my choice for this week's classic pick. And now it's time to open the mail. Hilda in Boynton Beach says, I see so many movies where animals, horses and dogs, etc., are shot or abused. I don't want to watch that. Do they have to do that to the animals? Hilda, I, like most of us, are animal lovers. And believe me, whatever you think about Hollywood, they're not stupid. They know moviegoers would revolt if animals were really being hurt. That used to be a problem, but now filmmakers go out of their way, even having special animal trainers and animal control people on the set. In addition, when you see that American Humane Association seal at the end of a movie, it means they've had observers during the production to make sure that stuff doesn't happen. You can email me, send me your comments and questions to Steve Bogart at WXEL.org and include your name and your hometown. Now it's time for Carla's special campy pick. And today, it's the 1956 stinker, The Mole People. But there is something special about it. Watch and be amazed. were in 3000 BC. To reach this lost civilization, science had followed a trail through burning desert sands, through the roaring avalanches of Mount Kuitara, and finally deep into the bowels of the earth. Not even history had recorded the existence of this unknown empire of darkness. There is no world beyond ours. If I ever get out of here, into my world. The world of light and flowers? Would you come with me? Never before had outsiders beheld such sights. The sacred ritual of the sun death, the blazing sacrificial chambers, the court of the all-powerful high priest of Ishtar. You will die in the fire of Ishtar. Did he say Ishtar, that word? The mole people, which cost next to nothing to make, used stock footage, and some of the props were picked up at $1.98. It was made in 1956. How did they know then that more than 30 years later, Hollywood would spend 90 million bucks to produce a loser of a movie with Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman called Ishtar? It lost 80 million. Let's look at a few seconds of this one. A little dollar, da, da, da. Work. Not quite baiting in Hoffman's best work after all, but now back to the mole people. 
you will die in the fire of Ishtar. The blood-lusting mole people storming from their subterranean caverns. Beaumont, Ward Cleaver, in the mole people. I love it. Now it's time for Steve's real pick. And this week, it's 1989's Do the Right Thing, the comedy drama written, produced, directed, and starring Spike Lee. Good morning, Miss Mother's sister. Now, Mookie, don't work too hard today. The man says it's going to be hot as the devil. I've been here 25 years. The South's famous pizzeria is here to stay. Trust me. Mookie, the last time I trusted you, we ended up with the sun. I know you can't stand it. You can't stand it. Hey, hey, Sal, how come there's a brother from the wall here? You want brothers on the wall? Love. Get your own place. You can do what you want to do. What I tell you about the noise? What I tell you about them pictures? You talk to brother, talk to him. You the man. No, you the man. No, you the man. No, you the man. The first time you turn your back, boom. Ah! Right here, man, in the back. Y'all take a chill. You like to sign a petition to boycott South's famous pizzeria? Hear me, what you ought to do is boycott that no good barber that messed up your head. And that's the double truth. Rude. Fight the power. Fight the power. You know, deep down inside, I think you wish you were black. <laughs> Who told you to step on my sneakers? Who told you to walk on my side of the block? Who told you to be in my neighborhood? I own this brownstone. Who told you to buy a brownstone on my block in my neighborhood on my side of the street? I can't even hear myself think! From Spike Lee. Director of School Days, and she's gotta have it. Good people, please! If we don't stop this, no, we can stop it now. We're gonna do something we're gonna regret for the rest of our life. Doctor, come on, what, what? Always do the right thing. The movie's about life in Brooklyn's once notorious Bedford Stuyvesant on the hottest day of the year. Even in those clips, you can feel the heat, see the heat. Spike is wonderfully unaffected as Mookie, and Danny Aiello was nominated for an Oscar for his role as Sal, the Italian pizzeria owner in the middle of it all. It's about heat. Lee's direction and color and use of light make you feel the heat, just as I said, right from the get-go. And it's about racism and anger that explodes into violence. It's disturbing, but it's also got a lot of humor. It's a wonderful film that should be seen, and it marks the beginning of Mr. Lee's ascension to the upper echelon of movie directors, where in my opinion, he remains today. This week in Steve's Real Hits, we highlight my favorite actress, except for Lauren Bacall, of course, she's my mother, Jodie Foster as FBI agents Clarice Starling and Anthony Hopkins as the terrifying Hannibal Lecter in 1991's Silence of the Lambs. Clarice? You spook easily, Starling? Not yet, sir. He's past the others. The last cell. I'll be watching. You'll do fine. A killer is on the loose. Keeps them alive for three days. Then he shoots them, skins them, and dumps them. A rookie FBI agent is on his trail. He's got real physical strength, cautious, precise, and he's never impulsive. He'll never stop. But in order to track him down, she'll have to match wits. I'll help you catch him, Clary. Believe me, you don't want Hannibal Lecter inside your head. With the darkest of all minds. Just do your job and never forget what he is. Oh, he's a monster. Pure psychopath. So rare to capture one alive. So close to the way you're gonna catch him, do you realize that? Oh, Clarice, your problem is you need to get more fun out of life. You told me you don't spook easily. You 
call this easy, sir? Lester's missing hand arm. Man's a raving maniac. Who knows what he'll do? Thank you, Clary. I met Jodie Foster once when I went to the Oscars. I was tongue-tied and she was so gorgeous and so nice. Anyway, this was only the third movie to win Oscars in all five categories. Best Picture, Best Actress and Actor for Jody and Anthony Hopkins, Best Director, Jonathan Demme, and Best Screenplay, Ted Talley. My favorite line in the movie, Hannibal Lecter. A census taker tried to test me. I ate his liver with fava beans and a nice Chianti. Have a nice dinner. It's time once again for Steve's Real Hits. And when you hear this... I don't think you'll have any trouble figuring out what movie I'm talking about this time. What we are dealing with here is a perfect engine. An eating machine. <laughs> a great white shark. A stake to claim in the waters off Amity Island. You yell barracuda. Everybody says, huh? Why? You yell shark. We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. <laughs> This shark, swallow you whole. Whoever have one do this before? I don't know. That's right, it's Steven Spielberg's mega hit, 1975's Jaws. That memorable music was created by John Williams, who, by the way, has five Oscars and an astounding 47 nominations. The film was based on Peter Benchley's novel, and it scared us all and made us all, including yours truly, think twice about going in the water that summer. The movie co-starred Roy Scheider, Richard Dreyfuss, and Robert Shaw, and it took the country and the box office by storm. At the time, the biggest grossing film ever. Don't worry, the water's fine. Sure it is. So my friends, mark your calendars. April 26th, our new season begins. All new of Bogart on Movies. Right here, exclusively for you on WXEL. So please join me next week for the launch of our second season. Thank you very much.